represents the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ, that his body was broken for you and for me. And for as often as you eat of this bread, I want you to do so knowing that this is your healing, that with his stripes, you're healed. This bread striped with your healing. And no matter what the doctor saw, whatever, no matter what the x-ray saw, no matter what the test saw, he gave you healing 2,000 years ago. See that. For as often as you eat of his broken body, you do so in remembrance of him, you may eat. This cup represents the blood of Jesus. Oh, thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood that has forgiven us of all of our sins, that's made us whole again. Thank God for his blood. And this cup is the blood of Jesus. For as often as you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of him, you may drink. And now we declare over your life, over your physical body, over your conscious thinking, that you and all that is concerning you as well, everything gonna be all right, amen? amen. Father, we thank you for this, another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords, think through my mind. None of me and all of you. And Satan, I bind all of your activities. And we thank God that Jesus is Lord. And everybody that agrees said, amen. amen. If you have your Bibles, join me in a little book, Third John. Third John. It's first John, second John, and then third John. And when you get there, look at verse two. Third John, verse two. Third John, verse two. I want you to really ask the Spirit of God to help you to hear and to give you anointed hearing. And those of you who are watching through the internet, and our other fellowship churches, thank God for the anointing to hear, that you have anointed ears, that you're going to hear beyond what I say. Breakthrough doesn't come just by reading the Word of God, but breakthrough comes when you get a word from God. And I believe that if you'll listen with your, not only your natural ears, but your spiritual ears, you'll hear the Holy Spirit say something to you. When he says something to you, write it down so you won't forget it. That's how breakthrough comes. What's the difference between two guys, both of them read the same scripture. One guy, something happens, the other guy, nothing happens. Well, the difference is a word from God instead of just the word of God. Thank God for the word, but we want to receive revelation, a word from God that's spoken to you directly that's going to give you directions and insight on some things that you uh, will begin to do. Write it down. Don't ignore it. And just let's believe God that before I finish, everybody will have heard a word from God. Amen. And then that'll be breakthrough for your life. Third John, verse two. Verse two says this, beloved, read it with me. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. Even as thy soul prospers. Pull up the amplifier to that one. He says, uh, and notice this is important, beloved. That's the first thing I've got. I, I, wouldn't, I didn't even pay that attention years ago when I read that scripture. But now it's so huge. Look how he addresses us. Beloved. I've got to believe that I am beloved. I've got to believe that I am highly favored and loved by God. Say it again. I am loved greatly by God. 
see, if, if there's something going on in your life that has convinced you that God doesn't love you, if there's something you have done, something that's taken place in your past, and somehow you're convinced that God doesn't love you, you have got to settle that. God loves you. He is committed to loving you. Now, the Amplified says here, he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in every way. Believe that God loves you so you can believe that he wants you to prosper in every way. Think of that. He wants you to prosper in every way. Say out loud, God wants me to prosper in every way. Beloved, I pray that you prosper in every way and that your body may keep well. Even as I know your soul keeps well and prospers. So he wants you to prosper in every way. So you know prosperity here is not just referring to money because that's just one way. He wants you to prosper financially, but he wants you to prosper in every way. He wants you to prosper in your physical body. He wants you to be well. What, what, what's prosperity of the physical body? Being well. He wants your marriage to prosper. He wants it to be well. He wants your soul to prosper and your emotions to prosper. Why? He wants that to be well. He wants the relationship with your children to prosper, your family to prosper. He wants that to be well. He wants your business to prosper, on your job to prosper. He wants your ministry to prosper. He wants that to be well. You know what he's saying? He wants all things well with you. Say out loud, it is well with me. He wants everything well with you. He says above all things. Now that's pretty powerful. He says above everything else. Here's what I'm praying. I pray that all will be well with you. See, the world defines prosperity as money. They're not incorrect, but they're incomplete. Prosperity is not just money. It's prospering in your spirit. What's prosperity in your spirit? Being born again. It's prospering in your soul. Renewing your mind is prospering in your body, being healthy and well, prospering in your marriage. He wants it all well with you. And, and here's the key. Here's the key right here. I believed I am highly loved and favored by God. And you know what? You've got to start. You've got to start soaking in that. You've got to start meditating in that. You got to start spending time becoming consciously aware of that, bringing it to your conscious mind every day. God loves me. Don't ever take that for granted, because what happens is when you don't believe you are the beloved of God, when you don't believe that God loves you, when you can look at your life and find all of the reasons why things may not should be working for you, you're going to have a problem with every promise that God will make to you. Because you'll read a promise and you'll say, well, that's not for me because, you know, I, I've been bad. Or, or I, hadn't, I hadn't been perfect like you thought all everybody else was. Or I hadn't been this or that. No, 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 no. You've got to understand that because of Jesus and because of his blood, he loves you. He loves you. For him, for him to reject, in a sense, for him to reject, to deny you, that's what the scripture says in 2 Timothy. For him to deny you. Uh, himself is to deny you. He won't do that. He loves you. What an amazing thing to meditate on. I am highly favored and loved by God. But now here's the thing. Say this out loud. Lord, help me not to focus on things that will hurt me. Now, now where'd that come from? Because if you can focus on the things that will help you Amen. instead of focusing on the things that will hurt you, focus on this love. What do I mean by focus? On purpose, bring it up. Bring it up on purpose. Bring it up on purpose every single day. Bring it up before you walk out of the house. Spend time 
thinking about and considering how much God loves you. And you know what? The devil has a hard time bringing problems and, and destruction into the lives of people that they know that know that they're highly loved of God. Look at John, the apostle of love. They could hardly kill him because he knew he was loved by God. They bought him in all. It didn't work. They did everything to try to kill him. It did not work. Why? Because he was so convinced that God loved him so much that there was a power released over him, a shield released over him. And what the religion does is try to tell us how bad we are and, and, and how unequipped we are and how incomplete we are and, 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 and oh, you hadn't pleased God. And it's that whole thing of the law that says, you know what, if you don't do good, then you're not going to get good. That was right under the law. Do good, get good. But under the grace of God, remember, even though you do good, God's not good because you do good. God's good because God's good, not because you're good. The children of Israel were not delivered out of Egypt because they were good or they had good behavior. They were delivered out of Egypt because God made a promise and God is good. Amen. And regardless of how they acted, it would not stop God from doing what he said he would do. And so likewise today, God's good to you because he's good to you. And you need to receive the love that he has for you. Don't ever doubt that love. God is not a God is not mad at you. God is not punishing you. God is not even in a bad mood where you're concerned. God loves you. Say it, God loves me. So here is a, a, a huge first base for the prosperous life. Believe that you are God's beloved. Believe that you are God's beloved. That's huge. That's huge. You, you, can, do, you can do all the things you do. But you know what? If, if you give and you don't believe God loves you, you won't believe that it will be given back to you. I mean, why would he give back to me? I mean, you know, y'all just don't know what I've been doing. Yeah, I come to church, lift my hands up, shama shama this and shama shama that. Hallelujah, a little bit here, hallelujah, a little bit there. But y'all don't understand. God can't do nothing for me because I ain't, I ain't right. Well, none of us ain't right without Jesus. You know that, don't you? Now, there may be some self-righteous people, but nobody's right without Jesus. The only reason we write is because Jesus is right. And we got into Jesus and the experiences of Jesus have become our experience because I am in Christ. But out of Christ, I ain't nothing. Look at this religion. Look at some of this religion in here detoxing still. What? Because under the law, it was all about God had a part and you have a part. Under the law, it was about you, whatever you do, God do. Under the law, do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. Under the law. But Romans 6.14 says what? We are no longer under the law. Sin has no dominion over us because we're not under the law, but we're under what? Grace. So under the law, that's how you operate it. But under grace, there's a new way of freedom. And we've got to understand what that new way of freedom is. See, what happens is condemnation brings death. Condemnation kills and guilt kills. The Bible says when you're in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no more what? Condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after self-effort performance and the way of the law. That's what that means, isn't it? But they walk by the Spirit. Now that's what this, 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 this uh, series is going to be about. Learning how to live life as holy, special, set aside, uncommon men and women of God. That's what holy means. To be holy means you're uncommon. The opposite of holiness is not sin. The opposite of holiness is to be uncommon. When you are holy, that means you're not common with the world. You're not common with everybody else. The rest of the world has a financial downturn. You are prospering. The rest of the world will cuss you out if you pull in front of them in the car. You say, praise the Lord. You're uncommon. When the world looks at you, you're that peculiar treasure. You're uncommon. And the way you become uncommon is not by your works. You just behold Jesus who is uncommon. And as you behold him, the Holy Spirit begins to, tr to transform or to change you into the image that you're beholding. You've got to focus more on Jesus than you focus on your problem. It is Jesus who has given you the gift of no condemnation. Say, I have the gift 
through the blood of Jesus, of no condemnation. No matter what I do, no matter what dumb decision I make, I will not condemn myself or be condemned. You know, to condemn, yeah, yeah. Yeah. To condemn a building mean it, it says that that building has no further use. You don't ever think because you miss the mark that you're no longer can be used by God. For as long as you are alive and living, once you're born again, God always finds a use for you. Now, through his foreknowledge, he knows that you may decide not to go a certain way. But you don't limit God because God can't be limited. God will take you like clay and say, oh, I thought I could make this vessel of, out of you, but you wouldn't cooperate. Oh, I'll take the clay and I'll make something else then. See, God is always willing to use you if you're willing to be used by God. Amen. No condemnation. He said to that woman that was caught in the act of adultery. They caught her in the act of adultery in the midst of the sheets. They pulled her out of bed, sheets and all, brought her to the religious people, threw up in front of them, and they began to test Jesus. Now, the law of Moses said, because of what she did, she should be stoned. Jesus said, okay, I have come to deliver you guys from the law, so let me raise it up a little bit. Yep, you're right. The law of Moses says she should be stoned. Therefore, let those who have no sin cast the first stone and none of them could stone sin a stone because they all had some sin come on so they all went away and Jesus was left with that woman and decided let me give her one more gift so she don't have to do this anymore he said she said woman where are your accusers he said they're all gone she he said neither do I accuse you neither do I accuse you and I do not condemn you go and sin no more. What did he do? He gave up the gift of no condemnation. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. See, if she left condemned, she would have sinned some more. But because she left with no condemnation, hallelujah, she was able to go be successful. He did the same thing with the woman at the well. The woman at the well, he came to prophesy to her. Watch this. Jesus loved her so much, he changed the route of his journey. So he could make sure he could go by to see this one woman who was depressed, who was rejected, who had, could, just couldn't get a, a healthy relationship, who had been married all these times. And Jesus came to this woman and began to speak to this woman and began to say some things to her and prophesy to her. And he even told her, he said, he said, the man you living with now. She was known with a, with a bad reputation. But Jesus began to minister to her and he found no, and would not condemn her. And guess what the woman said? Now she told, he told the lady, don't go tell nobody. She couldn't help it. The Bible says she went to the city and she said, Lord have mercy, come see a man that told me everything that I ever knew, everything that I ever did. I'm telling you, when you experience that kind of love, you're going to go out. It ain't going to be no problem to go and witness to people. You try not to say nothing. But what he did and how he loved you, it just exploded in you and you had to tell somebody. Remember that song, said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I couldn't keep it to myself. Whenever God does something for you, you ain't going to be able to keep it to yourself. Whenever God delivers you out of a ditch you've been stuck in all your life, you can't keep it to yourself. And that's what I believe that Jesus is going to do in these last days. He's going to do something in all of our lives that we won't be able to keep it to ourselves. And where you would not go soul winning, Jesus is going to do something so awesome that you're going to find yourself soul winning where you said you weren't going to soul winning. That's what's about to happen in this house. Y'all better get ready. Something so amazing, something so awesome, something so glorious, something so magnificent is getting ready to happen in your life. You think Jesus can just use the preacher? No, he getting ready to use you. Everybody in here got a testimony. Everybody in here got something that Jesus has done. Everybody been in a ditch somewhere. And Jesus is the one that brought you up out of that ditch. This is the prosperous life that I'm talking about today. Said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I couldn't keep it to myself. 
Jesus. Beloved. Beloved. I pray above all things that you prosper or that you would be success in every way. In every. Think of that. Think of that. In every way. This is God's plan. In every way, I want you successful. Would you receive that this morning? Amen. Successful in every way. See, it's one thing for somebody to say that. It's another thing. Jesus, this in, in the word of God, he wants you to be successful in every way. And then he wants your body to keep well. So if your body's not well, that's not the will of God. The will of God is in this word. The will of God is that your body keep well. Speak to your body. Say, body. Keep well. Keep well. Keep well. He says, even as. All right, now that's now here's the key. Prospering in every way, financially, spiritually, soul, body, prospering in every way is subject to the prosperity of a man's soul. Even as your soul prosper. So everything else will prosper as goes your soul, mind, will, emotions, thinker, feeler, chooser, as goes your soul, so goes everything else. Uh, the scripture says, as a man thinketh, then in his heart, so is he. As goes your soul, your soul, how are you thinking? Are your emotions controlling you or are you harnessing your emotions? How you think, how you think. So now watch this. If the enemy will do anything, he will major on getting you to focus on wrong thinking. Because wrong thinking will prevent being successful in every way. How's your thinking been lately? Where are you getting your thinking from? Who's governing your thinking? What you see, what you hear, what you are exposed to will determine the way you think. What you are around, what you look at, what you are exposed to, the words you hear determine how you think. If all you're hearing is your crazy daddy, then you're going to think crazy. If all you're hearing is your saved, born again daddy who lives by the word of God, then that's the kind of life you're going to be able to listen to. You're going to have to bring to a point. You've got to bring it to this point in your life. I must not allow my thinking to be governed by anything else that is on the outside of the word of God. Well, I don't know about that. Well, it ain't been going too good so far, has it? And that's what this series is about. It's about making adjustments in the areas where you can be successful in every way. In every way. And you can. But wrong thinking is going to produce wrong living. And wrong thinking is going to produce wrong believing. And wrong thinking will not allow you to be successful in every way. How's your thinking? Is it lining up with the word? Because walking in the flesh is a way of thinking that does not line up with the word. But walking in the spirit is a way of thinking that lines up with the word of God. You got to think in line with God's word. No, you see, see, you can't be so busy thinking about, you know, the, the dollar signs because all of this is the guts before you get to the dollar signs. The dollar signs will take care of itself. But do you know that money acts like a person? It knows who to be attracted to and it knows who to run from. Money will run from a prideful, greedy, wasteful, lazy person. Money don't want to be attached to that kind of person. Money will attract itself, will be attractive to people who, who are godly and think godly because God gives us power to get wealth. And some of you are repelling money with just your lifestyle. Money, money ain't hanging around you. It's trying to get away from you. Money has a call on its life. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I don't know if y'all want me to say this. I said money got a call on its life. You know, money cries. Y'all don't, y'all, y'all, y'all sitting up, y'all sitting up here looking at me like, what planet did you come?
Can I show it to you in scripture for a moment? James chapter 2. See, it ain't, it's never going to be attracted to people with wrong motives. James chapter, let me find this. Mm-hmm. Lord, I'm trying to flow with the Lord with a new Bible. Lord, I need my old Bible. Somebody go back there and get my old Bible. My old Bible, I got I to gotta, I gotta go with something that's tested. James chapter 5. Go to James chapter 5. All right, now watch this, verse 1. James chapter 5, verse 1. Go to now. Are you there? Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Now, I got to ask you a question. Thank you so much. Oh, yes, baby, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, isn't that a blessing? The blessing of the Lord. All right. All right. Go, 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 go to now, you rich men. Now, 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 now think with me now. He's talking to rich men. And, I, and, I, and I'll show you it's wicked rich men. Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Now, what is it that's going to cause a rich man to, to do this? When he lose his money. Verse 2. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you. And shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. So God called the wicked rich to do something. Reap the treasure up. I'm going to use it for the last days. Isn't that what he said? Yes. Verse 4. Behold the higher. All right, watch carefully. The higher is, is the paycheck. Behold the higher of the laborers. The laborers who have reaped down your fields. Look at their, look at their paycheck. Look at their, their hire. Which is of you that money is kept back by fraud. Comma, that money that's kept back by fraud crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, or the Lord of hosts. And now notice what he says. He says the money cries. Because it's in the hands of wicked people. And then he says, the people that's supposed to have it, they're crying. Not like that. They're not like, oh, Jesus, they got my money. No, no, no. These are, these are grace people. Hear what they're saying. In the name of Jesus, I know God that I, he loves me and I, I, I'm, I'm already prosperous and, and, and I'm already uh, 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 successful in every area. He did it for me 2,000 years ago. That's your cry. So here's what's happening. The money is crying because it's not supposed to be where it is. But it's trying to find out where it's supposed to be. So it's looking for the cries of the righteous. It's looking for somebody who's already believed that they've received it. Somebody who already know what grace is made available. Somebody that will begin to say, yes, I'm prosperous. Yes, he loves me. All is well in every area. And the money like, there they go, there they go, bam, they found you. I have found you. I tell you, the next time you go in the neighborhood, roll your window down, and you'll hear some houses saying, get these sinners out of me. <laughs> they don't belong in me. Get these sinners out of me. Come back. You belong here. So the next time you go looking at the house, don't be sitting up there looking at the price talking about what you can't afford. Tune your ear in to see if that house is calling you. Y'all, 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 see y'all. But see, if you don't get yourself together, money repels you. And it's supposed to be attractive to you. Amen. 
<laughs> now, I'm sure there are always people who listen to me talking about this stuff. I'll tell you one thing. I, I, there are some radio stations in this city that won't allow me even to buy an ad because I believe that God is a God that will prosper you. Isn't that sad? Oh, you come grumble down them church. Oh, we can't play y'all, y'all prosperity people. Well, aren't you? No, we're not prosperity people. Well, why are you working then? Why don't you just quit your job and, and move out your house and live on the bridge and be poor? I mean, you, you hate prosperity. Why prosper then? Sell your cars, man. Give it all away. If you think Jesus was poor and that pleases Jesus, then you need to be like Jesus because the Bible tells us to be like him. If you believe he was poor, be like Jesus, man. Sell everything. Give it all away, man. Go move under the bridge and have a hold a sign up and say, I'm like Jesus, man. But Jesus wasn't like that. So you got to understand, when Jesus came to the earth, money started looking for him. Y'all better watch out now. Those kings. Those kings. And it took them two years to find him, but the money wouldn't stop. I said it took them two years. It took, took a little time, but they got there. When they found him, he was about two years old. And they came with gold and frankincense and myrrh, and they laid it at his feet. Ain't no way what Jesus was broke because kings made sure money started locating. Soon as the star appeared, the money started. They spoke to him, go find him. Prosperity will find you. But the churches, uh, we, we, we don't want to have that. We, want, we don't have love and joy and peace. And you ain't going to get none because you ain't got no money. You ain't got no love, joy, and peace. You ain't got no love, joy, and peace. Your wife ain't been fixed for three weeks. Her hair all nappy. She can't get no weed. How do you think you're going to have some love and some joy and some peace? You got to get that woman weed, man. You got to get her hair fixed. Ain't no one. No, 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 no. I ain't got nothing to eat. It's hot outside. The air conditioning ain't working. It's been broke for two years. You talking about love, joy, and peace. God says he wants everything to be well with you. He says he wants it all well with you. And these folks, the body of Christ tried to lynch me when I started preaching on prosperity. And it didn't help that my last name was Dollar. I just thought maybe that was a godly thing, you know. You look through the Bible, God would give names to people based on their assignment. Jesus is not coming back for a church that's broke, busted, disgusted, sorry, begging, religious, in the law, condemned church. Faith comes by hearing. If I don't preach it, you won't have faith to hear it. Somebody said, well, Pastor, I thought you stopped preaching it. No, I ain't stopped preaching it. I'm, ju I'm just waiting till you grow up. Yeah. All right. I always know what I have was good, but you wasn't, you wasn't ready for it back then. I believe you're ready now. I believe you're ready for it now. And when you meet your friends and say, oh, y'all go to that rich church, don't you sit there and argue with them. You say, yes, amen. You say, shown up, shown up. Go back to third John here now. Well, let me, let me show you something first. Go to uh, go to St. John chapter 1 and verse 17. Now we're talking about grace-based prosperity. Now, how does that fit into all this now? Are you there? All right. Let's read verse 17 out loud together. Ready to read. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace and what? Came by Jesus Christ. Now notice now, whatever's on one side of the and is in relationship with what's on the other side of the and. Please understand this. Grace and truth are synonymous. They are the same. When you touch grace, you touch truth. When you touch truth, you touch grace. Um, and you shall know the truth, that's grace, and the truth shall set them free.
from the law. You see that? You can't rightly divide the word of truth without knowing grace. Without knowing this unmerited favor. Hallelujah. So everywhere in the Bible, get used to it. When you see truth, you can't know it without grace. When you see grace, you can't know it without truth. Because grace is truth. And truth is grace. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Now go back to 3 John. Verse 2. Now, as you can tell, in, in this series, I'm going to take my time. I'm going to go, I'm going to turn over every rock we can hit. Why? I, I believe in God that after this series, that the income in your life has increased along with the peace. You know what peace means? Peace is translated wholeness. Somebody say, I'm whole. I'm whole. You know what whole means? Nothing missing and nothing broken. Now, am I saying that everybody's going to be millionaires? I would like for everybody to be millionaires. But what I am saying is that everybody's going to have more than enough to do what God called you to do. So I say, well, Pastor, I don't need that much. Well, you're going to get what you need, and then you're going to have some left over to help somebody else. More than enough. Now, that may not mean millionaire status for everybody, but more than enough. Amen? Now, 3 John 2, verse 2, says, Beloved, thank you, Lord, you love us. I wish or pray above all things that thou mayest prosper, prosper and be in health even as thy soul prosper. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the grace. You see that? That was in thee, even as thou walketh in the, walk in grace, man, walk in truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my churches walk in, that's the truth. Now look at what he's saying here. He starts off talking about you prospering in every area, then he starts talking about, boy, walk in in the truth walk in the truth oh god i see this you know what he's saying here he is saying what i said in verse two i didn't intend on you to do this with your own performance i didn't intend for this to happen through your own effort if you will walk in truth or walk in my grace what you'll be walking in You'll be walking in an absolute trust of my unmerited favor. Two things I want you to hear. You are going to live one way or the other. Two ways you're going to live. Here's the first way. you got to choose. You're going to either live a life where you are depending on merited favor or deserved favor. That's favoritism and self-effort. So you're going to live a life where you depend on the favor you can deserve. You will, you will either live a life where you will you be you'll be dependent upon the favoritism that you can earn. See, favoritism stinks with self-effort. That's you're going to you're going to live a life that's going to be based on your education. That's going to be based on whether they like you or not. That's going to be based on how hard you work. All of those things are important. But see, you're dependent on that. There's no Jesus anywhere. You're dependent on that. You're going to live a life where you're going to depend on self-effort and deserve favor. You can live that way. How many of us have lived that way already? We've already lived that way, right? You can only go so far, right? Or you can live a life depending on unmerited favor. Glory to God. And the blessings of God. A life where you're depending and, and you're dependent upon unmerited favor and the blessings of God. Wow. Wow. That's the life I'm living on. A life that says, Lord, I'm depending on you. Not my efforts. I'm depending on you. Not my um. 
my education. I'm not, I'm not saying any of these things are bad, but see, we're depending too much on the human mystic man and his ability while we exile God. Now, here's the deal with that. Every successful endeavor, every successful outcome, business, every successful part of your life was successful because of unmerited favor. It was never you. Let me say that again. Let me say that again. Every successful thing that's ever happened in your life happened because of unmerited favor. See, you have to be careful not to confuse what God made happen with you making it happen. Because supernatural things look natural glory to god it's how it turns out that makes it super now, let me see if I explain that there's a difference between the spectacular and the supernatural we don't live life in the spectacular those are things that are explosive they happen real quick it's like bam we didn't expect it but here's what the supernatural does notice the word supernatural it's god's super on your natural and you know what's you know what's powerful about supernatural the results are always outstanding and what God has done with some of you is he has moved supernaturally, naturally. Where it looked like it was you. You started going this way, didn't know why you were going that way. You did that, didn't know quite why you were doing that. You went to fill that out, you filled that out. You all of a sudden think about, let me go and do that application. You all of a sudden think about, you, you, you actually thought all of that. You actually thought you were that smart to figure all that stuff out. But God's so good, he make it seem like it was you. But you got to be smart enough to know that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father which is above. You got to be smart enough to know that when it was good and when it was right, it was God. It has never been you. Somebody says, what, 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 what about before I got saved? That's the whole deal. Before you got saved. It was the goodness of God that turned you and ministered to you and got your attention. You ain't, it ain't never been you. Man without God is bankrupt. It's never been you. It wasn't your preaching. You know, a preacher thinks he's successful because of him. You got to be kidding me. It ain't your preaching, it ain't your work, it ain't your calculation, it ain't cause you smart. Who made you smart? Who made you smart? Who made you smart? It ain't cause the wisdom you had or the idea. Who gave you the idea? Did you get the idea yourself? Who gave you the idea? Who gave you the favor? Who put you in front of that man? Why did he want to hire you? He could have, you don't get hired because you're qualified all the time. You get hired because they like you. You get hired because they favor you. Who did it? That was God stirring in the nest like an eagle stirs in a nest. That's God's been stirring in your nest. And somehow, when the success has ended, you thought it was you. And here's the key. The day you realize it wasn't you, then you can give praise to the right one. And as you become thankful to him for what he has done, he's now motivated to do more because you recognize it was the undeserved favor. A lot of stuff happened to us. We didn't deserve it. Tell me how you deserved it. How did you deserve the house? How did you deserve that wife? How did you deserve that husband? Tell me what specific rap you did to get her. Because if it was right, if it was you, it will work with anybody. But it only worked with her. Tell me how it happened. I'm telling you, it was God that got on you like he got on Abraham. Hallelujah. It was God. It's always been God. 
And the arrogance of it all is somehow you've allowed religion and your way of thinking and the humanistic view to make you think that God helps those who help themselves. God helped those who couldn't help themselves. Some of y'all was too far gone. It was God helping you when you didn't know how to help you. You, you didn't even have nobody around to help you. It was God helping you. Helping you to make the decision when you thought you were making the decision and, and helping you to turn left when that was you thought that was your decision to help you to turn left. And see, God already foreknew how the shook. He already foreknew every decision you would make. So he went ahead of you. Glory to God. And began to plot out all the steps and the tracks based on knowing and foreknowing your decisions so that you can end up right where he wanted you to end up. Because he knew you had to go this way in order to change your mind about going that way so he can get you to go down that way. You thought it was you. Somebody just need to lift your hands up and say, how great thou art. And this is what the Bible meant when he uses the phrase, the manifold wisdoms of God. It took many wisdoms to bring a man to the place where he was destined or called to be. So, so he's talking beloved. love. I want you to prosper in every way. I don't even want your body to keep well. But I need your soul to prosper. And I said, well, how? Oh, my God. How should my soul prosper so I can prosper in every way? Here it goes. In this grace. Prosper in this grace. And you know what he says in this grace? Here's what my soul needs to prosper on. Here's what my mind, my thinking needs to be, 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 be on. Through grace, what I'm after, Jesus has already done. The grace of God is God unmerited favor. It's me trusting Jesus. Let my soul prosper in knowing that it's me trusting Jesus. It's me Trusting Jesus. It's me trusting Jesus. Well, when I was teaching prosperity before, I thought, well, it's these five things you have to do or these seven things you have to do. Now I've got it down to one. Trust Jesus. Well, Brother Dollar, I, I mean, don't you mean man should do his part and then God does his part? Don't you mean man ought to do the best that he can and then God will come and do the rest? No, that ain't what I mean. That's, that's how we operated when we were under the law. That's how religion under the law or mixtures of law and grace, that's how, how they operate. No, 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 that ain't what I mean. The danger of saying stuff like that is that you cause people to go back to operating by the law. You have a part, God has a part, do good, get good, do bad, get bad. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about doing all I can do and then God does what he can do. No, I'm talking about trust Jesus. See, what I'm going to show you in a minute, your doing is going to be effortless, effortlessly because it's going to be born out of the grace that God's given you. In other words, you're going to find yourself doing the thing that grace wants you to do. The grace knows how to direct you in your doing. What we've been doing is just doing stuff, hoping grace will be on it. We come up with something in our own way and it wasn't born out of the grace of God. And then it takes years because we, we keep thinking it's us. Uh, go to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 13 and 14. No, no, no. We're not talking about that kind of thing where you, you know, 
God is going to do the rest. I'm going to do the best because remember now, God helps those who help themselves. That's amazing to me. There are preachers that are still thinking it's in the Bible. The very next preacher that says it to me, I'm going to say, show it to me. Where is it? They're going to say, it's somewhere. It's somewhere. No, it ain't. Benjamin Franklin said that. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. Where that in the Bible? Show it to me. Uh, I think it's in 1 Corinthians. No, it ain't. Kurt Franklin said that. <laughs> so you keep letting the Franklin brothers get you to think stuff in the Bible and in the Bible. <laughs> See, when we say that, we're pointing people back to the old covenant of law. We don't want to point people back to the old covenant of law. You know, there's a journey, the journey we've gone on for 28 years to finally get us to the place where we can understand how to walk in the manifestations of it. And that's where I think we are right now. We are now going to be able to walk in the manifestations of it. I now see also why God had to take us through all of that. I wouldn't be able to even say some of the stuff I'm saying right now had we not gone through that. We wouldn't even see the distinction. It's almost like he did with the children of Israel. I got to give them the law first before I talk to them about this grace. That we had to see all that other stuff first so we can see the distinction and appreciate it. So no, I'm not upset that we got that last. Now that I got that, now I can see this better. Are you in Hebrews chapter 9, 13? Now watch this. So we don't say, we don't say, shouldn't there be a part for man to perform and another part for God to fulfill? Man doing his best and then... Letting God do the rest. No, because that's pointing people back to the ways of the law. We're under grace. We're not under the law. Verse 13 says this. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, if that blood of animals sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more? Shall the blood of Christ, who through eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, how much more can the blood of Jesus purge your conscience? Now watch this. Purge your conscience from what? From dead works. Underline dead works. So the blood of Jesus purged your conscience from dead works so you can serve the living God. Oh, so dead works are stopping people from serving the living God. That's what he said, isn't it? Dead works are stopping people from serving the living God, right? And he said the blood of Jesus has purged your conscience from dead works. All of a sudden, we better know what dead works are. Because dead works are causing people to stop serving the living God. Uh, the, the, uh, one translation says lifeless pursuits, lifeless observances. As dead works. That the blood of Jesus has purged your conscience from lifeless observances. So you can serve the living God. So when you depend on your own effort to, to deserve favor from God. When you depend on your own ability, your own performance, and your own efforts. That is called dead works. When you depend on what you do to deserve favor. That's called dead works. Well, I'm going to go over here and cook for for, for the people after church. And the Lord bless me. That's dead works. The blood of Jesus has purged your conscience from those dead works. Purge your conscience from, from self-effort. From self-effort trying to deserve favor. That's what dead works are. It's what you decide to do. If you think my... See, in the old covenant, it was their performance. That determined favor. God would not favor them if they did not deserve it. In the old covenant, you would had to deserve favor to get it. And under the covenant of law, you had to deserve the favor to get it. But under the covenant of grace, if you do works through your self-effort to try to deserve favor, that's called dead works. And he said the blood of Jesus has purged your conscience from thinking that you can do these things to deserve favor. And the reason why he purged your conference, your conscience from thinking that you can do these things to deserve favor is so you can now serve the living God by trusting only him. 
But guess what happens when you still think you can deserve favor? Well, I'm going to go to church so I can deserve favor. Well, I'm going I'm to I'm get some money so I can deserve money. I'm going to pray two hours so I can deserve a blessing. I'm going to treat people nice so I can deserve niceness. I'm going to do good so I can deserve good. That's under the law. That's dead works now because you're not under grace. It's dead works because we have a the, the sacrifice of Jesus and his blood. And he says it was designed to purge your conscience from self-effort that you thought would produce favor. Well, you know what I just described? Probably most of the churches in the world. Because that's what religion's taught us. That's why it sounds so strange while I'm telling you this stuff. I can see some of y'all detoxing like, what? Ain't that what we supposed to do? Uh-uh. That's why ain't nothing ever been able to happen. Somebody says, well, I had something to happen. Oh, that's because somebody was interceding for your <laughs> self. You didn't know no better. Now you know. Everything about prosperity is going to be leading to trust Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Trust Jesus. And that drives most of y'all nuts because you're used to, but I got to do something to make it happen. See, here's the deal. If you trust Jesus, then out of you, everything you need to do is going to come. So it won't be wasteful works or works that don't produce nothing. Dead works. It'll be anointed idea instead of an idea you're trying to get him to anoint. I can tell you, I see so many people that have good ideas. They don't work. They have good ideas and they have enough nerve to say, the Lord told me. And all you got to do is sit back and just wait. Time going to tell if that was the Lord. I wouldn't say the Lord told me. I'd just say, well, I, I, I'm going to try something. See if it work. Don't be putting that on God. You're not spiritual, y'all. If we say the Lord told us. Ah, y'all have saw. Thank God. The Lord, ah, the Lord told me. Mm. Lord told me to open up that tash. Tasha. 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 Ta. Ta 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 ta. Come on outside and time a tie. Every time I pray, I say tie. I say tie, tie. Well, actually, it's tire. But you say tie, tie. Is it a tie? Or is it a tire? You gotta get your tongue straight so it won't mislead you. That's how religion does. Religion plays these games, man. And everybody falls for it. And then when it doesn't work, <laughs> condemnation comes, guilt comes. Then we say the word don't work. Or I tried that before. I did that. But it was not born out of grace. Because we keep trying to deserve favor. Are you listening to me? All right, now watch this. I'm going to see if I can get this. I've got about four minutes left. So depending on your own efforts to deserve favor from God is considered dead works. It's God's desire for us to depend wholly on unmerited favor of Jesus. Say out loud. I depend, I depend wholly, wholly on the unmerited favor of Jesus. Favor of Jesus. I, depend I depend wholly, wholly on the unmerited favor of Jesus. I am depending on the unmerited favor of Jesus. I am depending on the grace of God. Why you got to say in all of this? Because I'm trying to get your mind to that, cast that thought down. The Christian life today is based on what you're doing and what you're not doing. The Christian life today is based on what you are doing and what you are not doing. Christianity was never supposed to be a religion. That's religion. Christianity was designed to be a personal relationship between you and God, and God was going to tell you what to do. But the flesh likes law. Because it gives it something to do and to boast about. Christianity is supposed to be about a relationship 
between man and his God and his God leading and guiding him. Christianity is supposed to be about a relationship between man and his God. And man is dependent on his God to tell him how to live. In this series, we are about to grow you up. We're about to say to you, we've got to learn how to be led by him because all of our success and all of our prosperity and all of our victory is in our relationship with him. And our relationship with him must go beyond what we do when we come to church. It must go beyond the 11 o'clock hour. It must be something that we, it is real to us. It is genuine with us. We know him and he knows us. We speak to him and he speaks back. Amen. 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 Christianity is not about what you do and what you don't do. If you think right, you're going to believe right. When you believe right, you'll behave right. When you behave right, it'll be right. But you don't. How about that? We want everything that God promised, but we don't want him. And the Bible made it clear. He says, I've given you Jesus and with him, you can freely receive all of the things. We want the free stuff without him. Here you do. Because your profession or what you do may not really be a good place for, you know, having a relationship with Jesus. But you want to be successful. So you rely on you. You know, you going to run out one day. Because the good was given to attract to the giver of the good. But you thought the good came from you. And so what happens? You spend all your life seeking favoritism instead of understanding the favor of God. I won't have time to go through all this, but go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 because I'm running out of time. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. Oh, let's see where I want you to go. <laughs> First Corinthians 15 and 10. 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to stop here. Are y'all excited about this series? This thing, oh man. This thing, you know. When I say we have a wealthy church, it's not just going to be in money. It's going to be in every area. We're going to take, take an offering up one time, and it's going to be $20 million. Some of y'all think, what? Yeah. We're going to start taking one offering for whatever we got to do. Oh, we got to build a church in Cleveland. Let's take an offering up. 20 million. And y'all gonna be fighting over that. I got the whole thing myself, Pastor. You don't need to take no offering up. I got it. I got this. And then somebody gonna say, oh, sit yourself right to sell down. You had that last week. I got this. And I'm gonna sit there and say, just, just let them go for it. Jesus, Jesus gonna work it out. Amen. You watch. There's a, there is a, there's gonna be there are things I've already written in your heart, saith the Lord. I have written those things in your heart from the foundations of the world. And now I'm about to stir it up out of you like a cyclone, like a tornado will it come out of you. When it proceeds forth from your belly, it'll be like a tsunami, saith the Lord. For it won't be strange to your inner man. For you'll know on the inside, I've always had that. But I'm about to shine the light on those things that I've written upon your heart. And you are destined to be successful in that which I called you to. For I have no relationship with failures. And a failure you'll never be, saith the Lord. And a failure you'll never be. Woo! God getting ready to get some tension. And he's going to use you as infallible proofs. When people see people of grace, they're going to see people happy. 
and they're going to wonder why they ain't happy. They're going to see people stress free. When they see people of grace, they're going to see they're going to see old people in age looking young. That's the grace of God. God is a Gandhi. He's already done it, but he's about to manifest some things in your life that will be proof positive that only Jesus could do something like that. So get ready. When you begin to see this thing stand up and stand out, I don't doubt you. Get ready. Lift your hands up real quick and say, thank you, Jesus. Don't even give yourself time to take credit for something that you know you didn't do by yourself. Here's something. Jesus went to a village and healed everybody in the village and not one of them was saved. Sister Betty, not one of them was saved. He healed every last one of them. I said, Lord, how are you going to do that? He said, because they required it of me. I said, but they wasn't saved. He says, but they required it of me. He said, you people are so legalistic about you being saved or not. You don't even have enough faith to require and expect it of me. I said, anyway, in the world, I'm going to let a bunch of unsaved folk get what I can have. And all he want me to do is to stand in grace and trust him. They trusted Jesus. When he went in there to heal them, they were not even saved. They trusted Jesus to do something they couldn't do themselves. They looked at him and said, oh, this is the man that can heal? Well, I trust him. Might as well. Ain't nothing been working for me. It ain't like they had hospitals everywhere. He said he can heal. I trust him. Jesus said, bam, there you go. Yeah. It's real simple. He just wants you to trust him. Last scripture. My time's gone, man. Let's see. Can I do this last scripture? Just one more. But by grace of God, but by the grace of God, here's Paul speaking, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. By his efforts? No. By his education? No. And he was educated. He said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Say out loud. I am, I am what, I am what I am by the grace of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not put on me in vain. Uh-oh, watch the next verse, because he's getting ready to say, that's a semicolon. He wasn't, I didn't have this grace in vain or for no use or reason at all. Look what he said. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I. But the grace of God, which was with me. Now, let me show you what Paul said. Paul said, listen here. He said, I started praying more. I started, I started studying more. I started meditating more. I started helping people more. Not because of a good idea that I had, but the grace of God on me poured it out of me. See, you worried about am I going to pray more? When this grace, when you start trusting in Jesus and receiving this unmerited favor, you're going to, you're going to pray more. You're not going to pray out of condemnation. You're going to pray more because grace is on you to pray more. You're going to serve people more because it, grace is moving you. It's prompting you. It's speaking to you. The, the, the labor flows out of you and you don't get tired versus you laboring, trying to get favor and you're worn out. It's doing the thing that grace is making available for you to do. Paul said, I labored more abundantly than all of them. He said, yet it wasn't I. But the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God that was with me, that caused me to do this labor. We keep coming up with labor trying to get grace. And grace will, will, um, what's that word, Lord, I'm looking for? Grace will order the labor that you should be walking in. Not you. Grace. All of a sudden you're doing mission work. Why am I doing it? Oh, it's just the grace of God owed me to do it. The grace of God led me to do this. Oh, man, look, you're like you doing more than you've ever done before. Yeah, but the grace of God's on me. Now, a guy that don't have the grace of God on him to do, he'll look at you like, man, why are you working yourself like that? Well, it's the grace of God on me. God told me to start these 500 uh, satellite churches. Going to, I've been going to back and forth 
from north to south for, I think, 10 years almost. How do you do that? Grace God's on me. Grace God. That was born out of the grace of God. Do this. Okay. Because God ain't ever tell you to do something that ain't got the grace of God on it. Wonder what is it that you should be doing that has the grace of God on it that you can't even hear to do because you're so woe out. And so you're so tired, you can't even hear God. You're so tired of working for Jesus, you can't even hear the work that Jesus wants you to do. I'm chilling a little bit, man. There are things I ain't going to do, man. I'm, I'm getting ready to go to Australia. And, you know, folks say, why are you here? Can you do this? Why are you here? Can you come over here? Why are you? No, I ain't doing none of that. Why? Grace didn't open that door. Grace didn't cause that labor to come forth. I'm only going to do what Grace told me to do. Amen. Amen. I was preaching in New York, but I was sleeping at home in Atlanta. Why? Because Grace didn't leave me, to, leave me to go over there and preach after I preached 10 hours in Houston. No, no, no. The old me said, oh, I got to, oh, I got to labor, but I wasn't hearing nothing. <laughs> I'm learning. Lord, help me when my labor is concerned. Because I don't want to keep doing stuff that don't have profit. It's a busy work. It's like in a rocking chair. Nothing but motion. But in a rocking chair, you ain't going nowhere. You stand right there, just rocking. And you know, you get tired on a rocking chair. If you rock real good, you get good and tired on a rocking chair. In this series, it's to straighten our thinking out from the law and cause it to come to the place where grace can take us and lead us and guide us. You get anything out of this this morning? All right. Praise God. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We are going to go over this budget next week. Now, Father, we thank you. We will not participate in dead works trying through our own efforts to deserve favor. We've decided to depend completely on your unmerited favor and the blessings of God in our lives. You want us to be successful in every way. You want our health to be well. It is your desire to prosper us. And so God, we walk in our souls Dependent on your grace. Oh, Jesus, dependent on your grace. Oh, Jesus, dependent on your grace. I thank you for it now. There's an anointing that we depend on from you to help us to get out of the situations that we're in. Hurtful situations, painful situations, harmful situations, situations of lack. There is an anointing. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you, Lord. And when the frustration of it all comes upon us, we will praise you for your grace that endures forever. We will praise you for your love. We will get our thinking in line with your way of grace. And Father, I thank you for, for this church. I thank you for all of our churches. I thank you for what you have done, and I thank you for the manifestation of it. World changers, churches will experience such manifestations, Lord, that we'll have no choice but to tell others, this is the unmerited favor that I've depended on and that I continue to depend on. So we resign from ourselves, and we come to you, Lord. Oh, my God. And we come to you. I love this church, but you love it more. And I know the angels in heaven and those that are here today rejoice. Because finally we will walk away from dead works. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, speak to our hearts. Now, we're depending on you where our giving is concerned now. And while we're praying, lead us in our giving. No more of us, but we're dependent on the grace of God to help us where our giving is concerned. And when you do that, 
budgets manifest met of over and above all the time because the givers are trusting you. And so we thank you for it now. In Jesus' mighty name, let this word spread around the world so that God will be seen as the God who prospers his people. And grace has already made it available. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need an offering envelope, if you'll please raise your hands. The ushers have them right now. Now, as you give, I'm serious. What do you feel in your heart that God is leading you to give? I did this this morning before I left. I was walking down the hallway and the Spirit of God said, I need you to give this. What do you believe in your heart? Those of you who are watching me in, in, in the Bronx, in New York, those of you who are watching me all, all over our network, all of our fellowship churches, what in your heart to give? The Bible says talks about whose heart is in their giving. We never know what that meant. Your heart is your spirit. So what is it that God is saying into your heart to give? I am convinced that doors open when we obey God in these areas. Things happen. Doors open. Now let's obey him. Let's just simply, all right, God, I'm going I'm to do what I believe you said. You start off with doing what you believe he said. You know where you're going to go on your way to? Doing what you know he said. And that's where we're headed. Where people are sure this is God and things begin to happen because we know how to be led of the spirit. That's the powerful thing about it. No more religion, but now relationship. And relationship will take you to places where religion could have never taken you. And that's what Christianity is about. A relationship with Jesus Christ. A for real relationship with Jesus. Okay, you ready to pray over? Father, we thank you for this relationship we have with you. That this grace that has not been given to us in vain. That Lord, what we do, we do out of an outflow of grace that's in us. We believe this is what we, in our heart, are to sow today. And we sow it in, in gratitude and in love and in honor. And we thank you, Lord, for this gospel of grace being preached to all the world. And then the end will come. Thank you for using us. Those who are watching over the Internet right now, you receive this prayer right now. Those of you who, you know, this is how you got your feet in this morning. You receive this prayer right now. You, you click on that thing on the right side of your screen. You receive it in Jesus name. Let us sow now because we love him. We honor him and we thank him in Jesus name. Amen. This is a on common offering. Amen. And we sow it by faith. Amen. Let's just go ahead and receive the offering this morning. <coughs> you know what the thing that thrills me is that you're not the only one here that are being blessed by the word and hearing, hearing this word and sowing and responding to it. It's an amazing thing to me, the number of people who watch over that Internet and they not only hear the word, they don't just get up and turn their computers off. They could do that. But here's what I thought about those who give in secret. Nobody can see them giving. Those who give in secret will receive openly. And I thank God for that. Does it mean that it's a little less than what you're doing? No. Because we're giving as the Spirit of God is leading and guiding us to give. Now lay hold of this tape. Get the CD, download it, listen to this thing over again. Get used to not just, well, that's what I heard at church, I heard it already. There are things here that you didn't hear. You know how it is, you put the, the CD on, you're thinking, man, I didn't hear that. There's a, there's a perspective that'll blow up when you do it. Study this series with me throughout the week. And then we come back and we get some more. Study it out. Study it out. Study it out. Let it get big in you. Let it explode in you. Just this part one today could cause a significant change in your life as you begin to seek God for it.
So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, get saved. Get saved now. Get saved today. If you're here today and you need to, you know, you're saying, I, I was really committed to the things of God, but I just seen my commitment kind of dwindle down. You know, you're saved, but you say, I want to really, you know, commit myself to the things of God and, 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 and make sure that I'm recommitted to those things of God. And thirdly, if you're here and you've never received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, man, this is it. And last but not least, if God, you believe, has appointed you and assigned you to be a member of this church or one of our fellowship churches, this is the time. It's the time to do it. It's the time to move. Nothing's going to happen different until you're willing to do something different. Be willing to do something different this morning. If you're not saved, get saved. Let Jesus into your heart. There's a spot that you've been trying to fulfill with everything else. And it's only going to be filled with Jesus. Commit yourself to him. Keep that commitment. Rededicate yourself. Not rededicate. You've already been saved. You saved. You saved. You saved. <laughs> I can't wait to teach on that. But you saved. If you got saved, you saved. Now, if you're doing something stupid, just recommit yourself to doing the non-stupid thing. That makes sense? So I've given to you four things. I pray to God in heaven that you, you make the decisions. It's time to be happy. And these decisions you make today, I think they'll make you happy. I think you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy the joy of the Lord, which will be your strength. Amen? So, um, church, if you'll stand. And uh, if, if those of you who know you want to come on down, come on down. Everybody else, if you would help me out today, minister to those who are around you. Turn to your left, your right, your front behind. Begin to share Jesus with somebody. Amen.
congregation, don't you appreciate those who've come down this morning? We absolutely do. We thank God for them. Amen. Father, I pray your mighty hands will be upon their lives, removing every burden, destroying every yoke in their lives. I thank you. They'll never be the same again. And we give you praise for them now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. At this time, if you'll turn this way and follow our deacons to the prayer room, they're going to take you and minister to you, give you biblical understanding of how to obtain and maintain what you came to receive. We thank God you'll never be the same again. A few announcements and you're out of here. Mark your calendar for the lunch of our first annual national community outreach on Saturday, April 26th from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. You can join Taffy and I in our network of churches as we go beyond the four walls of the church to make a difference. This year we will do a massive community cleanup. The entire family can volunteer. Registration is available online at events.creplodollarministries.org. Together, we will make a mark in our communities that cannot be erased. Ladies, are you ready for the annual Radical Women's Ministry Tea? Okay, let's do it again. Ladies, are you ready for the annual Radical Women's Ministry Tea? Okay, so you can purchase tickets today and you can join Taffy and BET's Sunday's Best Gospel Singer, Jessica Reedy, on Saturday, May the 10th, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. at Atlanta Marriott Marquis. Ticket prices are $50 and VIP tickets are $75. Tickets can be purchased online at worldchangers.org or in the dome lobby. There will be a radical, uh, there will be a radical scavenger hunt game Sunday, April 13th. Cool, the women's just doing all kind of stuff. To participate, simply collect as many blue R's as you can. The two women that collect the most R's will win one ticket to the T. And I guess they know what R's are. Be sure to submit your R's at Radical Women table in the Dome Lobby by 10 a.m. sharp next Sunday to win your free ticket. Uh, last two, do, do you have creative ideas, concepts, strategies to improve the ministry? Join us on Tuesday, April 15th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Write down your best suggestions and bring them to this meeting. You do not have to be a member of a department or a ministry to participate. This is a great way for you to propose solutions for our continued growth and improvement of our members and visitors' experience. And then finally, I don't deserve it. Uh, that song Jordan sung last uh, Sunday. It debuted at, uh, it, it's on the charts already at 35. We just gotta, we gotta climb it, amen. It's on iTunes Top 100. So download your copy today from iTunes or go to CreploDollarMinistries.org. You can also pick up a copy today at any Change Your World bookstore and music location. God bless y'all. You are blessed. See ya.